Well, recently, PBS FaceTime had a video, Why Magnetic Monopoles Should Exist. And I decided I need to do a reaction video because there's no real reason why they should exist, and they don't exist. And, but to start, I'll just let him introduce the topic. Physicists have been hunting for one particle longer than perhaps any other. It's not the tachyon or some supersymmetric particle, it's the magnetic monopole. And of all the fantastical beasts of particle physics, this is perhaps the most likely to actually exist. So, where are they all? Now, I'll say, initially, the reasons why it can exist is quantum dipoles fill all space. And when dipoles rotate, they form magnets that have north and south poles. In order to have a magnetic monopole, you must have a particle that only has magnetic charge and not electric charge. And there aren't any particles like that. They have never been observed. And if we consider a proton, for example, the proton shell is thought to be made of quantum fluctuations, which are dipoles. And so they have north and south pole. And the electron appears to have a similar type shell at the Compton radius, because if you have a shell at that radius, it gives you the electron mass and magnetic moment. So our two most fundamental particles that make up most of the universe appear to be made of quantum fluctuation dipoles, or at least partly. And so there's no way you can get a magnetic monopole from particles made like that. And with that, I'll let them show the next part of the video. You could also have symmetry between these equations if there was such a thing as magnetic charge. If you add magnetic charges to these equations, then you get a magnetic force that looks exactly like the electrostatic force. The physicist Murray Gell-Mann said that Everything not forbidden is compulsory, meaning that if the math of our physical theory allows it, then it exists in nature. Now, there's nothing in Maxwell's equations that really says that magnetic monopoles can't exist, except for the fact that James Clerk Maxwell set the magnetic charge to zero because he didn't believe that it existed. But in principle, it could exist, and so could magnetic monopoles, at least according to classical theory. But what about quantum mechanics? When quantum theory first appeared, it quickly revolutionized our understanding of electromagnetism by explaining it in terms of quantum fields rather than charges and forces. Now, we talked previously about how electromagnetism arose automatically from requiring that the equations of quantum mechanics had a particular symmetry. The measurements they predict are unaltered by changes in one simple property, the phase of the wave function. Electromagnetism pops into the equations as soon as we require this. But in that version of electromagnetism, the electric and magnetic fields are very different from each other and not at all interchangeable as they are in Maxwell's equations. In particular, the magnetic field emerging from the quantum theory must have zero divergence. Its field lines can never end, so it can't have its own charge unlike the electric field. So perhaps here we have our reason for the apparent non-existence of magnetic monopoles. Quantum mechanics, as the saying goes, forbids it. Well, not so fast. Don't underestimate the power of the obsessed physicist. Well, I should have mentioned that I skipped over about two minutes of introduction where he talks about historical um, development. Basically, that you can cut a magnet in half and it's still a magnet with north and south pole. You can't separate the north and south poles that way. And then he talked about Maxwell's equations and how mathematicians looked at the equations and said, well, they could be symmetric if there's a magnetic monopole. And so that's what piqued their interest. And that's reasonable. You say there may be magnetic monopoles. Let's look for them. But when you don't see them, if there's no observation, no experiment, then they're not there until you have an observation or experiment. 
So we have a case where there's an obsession over something that doesn't exist. And that obsession relates to the quote he gives of everything not forbidden is compulsory. And unfortunately, this is a problematic mindset from the mathematicians who control physics. Even though something is not physically real, they'll say it's compulsory. And which doesn't make any sense. It's not real physics if it's not physically real. And yeah, if you want to be a mathematician and derive something and go, oh, this is a cool math problem, fine. Um, but if you're saying it's physically real, you have to tie it into something physically real. And then he talks about wave functions, which he does all the time, like wave functions are what's physically real, when wave functions are just a description of wave properties of what's physically real. And the wave medium is a physically real medium that has to be made of particles, by the way. So he gets tangled up in all sorts of nonsense. Now, electricity and magnetism are not interchangeable because with electric fields, you have a positive charge and a negative charge, and they interact the way those charges do, or positive and positive, negative and negative. But when you're dealing with magnetic aspects, you're dealing with rotating charges. So it's a different mechanism. You can't get magnetism without rotating dipoles and moving charges. So it's a secondary effect. And then rotating magnets is a tertiary effect. And even though Maxwell's equation doesn't deal with rotating magnets that way. So you have to deal with electric charges and electricity being a different property from magnetism. And with that, I'll let him go with the next part of the video. The great Paul Dirac had a habit of discovering particles just by staring at the math. In 1928, he predicted the existence of antimatter this way, as we've discussed in a previous episode. But then, in 1931, just before his antimatter thing was verified, Dirac made another prediction of the existence of magnetic monopoles. His argument goes something like this. If you start with a dipole magnetic field, you can approximate a monopole by moving the ends far enough apart and somehow vanishing the connecting field lines. And there is a way to do that. If you build a solenoid, just a coil carrying an electric current, you get a dipole field whose connecting field lines are constrained within the coil to make the width of the coil much smaller than the length, and it looks like two isolated magnetic charges. This construction is called the Dirac string, and Dirac's argument is that if the string part of the Dirac string is fundamentally undetectable, then magnetic monopoles can exist. The second part of the argument is under what conditions that string is undetectable. So magnetic fields affect charged particles. In quantum mechanics, this works by shifting the phase of the particle's wave function. Imagine a charged particle, say an electron, passing by a Dirac string. To plot that trajectory, you add up all the possible paths of the electron, including paths to the left and the right of the string. Presence of the string with its magnetic fields should introduce different phase shifts depending on which side of the string the electron passes. And that would actually have a noticeable effect on the path of the electron. In other words, the string would be detectable. But there's one scenario where the string can never be detected. The amount of this phase shift is proportional to the electric charge. For the right value of that charge, the phase shift induced between the different sides of the string is exactly one wave cycle, which means no observable difference. So for the Dirac string to be undetectable, then electric charge can only exist in integer multiples of that basic charge. This is a very loose form of the argument, and you can get to this in different ways, but the upshot is that the string connecting monopoles is fundamentally unobservable, and Dirac argued that this makes it a mathematical figment, kind of like virtual particles, and reality should only be assigned to the monopoles themselves. On the one hand, this was taken as a prediction of the quantization of electric charge, 
Electric charge has to be discrete if there's even a single magnetic monopole in the entire universe. And of course we know that electric charge really is quantized. It can only be integer multiples of the charge of the electron, or maybe of quarks, a third of the electron charge. But instead of taking this as a prediction of charge quantization, you can also flip it. Magnetic monopoles are possible if electric charge is quantized. Charge turns out to be quantized, so quantum mechanics doesn't actually forbid monopoles. Well, I'll first say that Dirac's one of my heroes. But Dirac didn't discover many particles. In fact, he technically didn't discover any particles because he said he was too afraid to predict the positron. But he gets credited for it anyway because it, once the positron was discovered, it's obvious that was what he discovered. Although in 1930, he wrote a paper where he wrote that he thought he had discovered the proton, uh, that it was the proton that had come out of the equation. Although he couldn't explain why the math, mass was different. So the big problem with Dirac's theory is the solenoid is not real. If it's so small you can't see it that it's possibly vanishing, then it's physically vanishing and it's not real and the monopoles aren't real either. So you reach the point where you have a mathematical construct that's not something that could be physically real and you divorce yourself from reality. So the direct monopoles can't exist. And you, if you want to believe in them, well, it's like believing in God with no evidence. It's religion, not science. You have to have observations and experiments for it to be believe, believable. But in this case, the direct string solenoid between the monopoles is not observable. That's, <laughs> you, you just can't do physics that way. And I won't go on into the next segments because from there he goes way off the deep end and says, well, grand unified theories predict it and you have Higgs fields and you have the hedgehog configuration, all of which is imaginary physics. It's not based on anything physically real, anything that's been observed either directly or indirectly in experiments. And then he says, well, and inflation theory supports it. Well, of course, inflation theory is nonsense because you can't inflate the universe because the universe doesn't have dimensions by itself. It's just a container for matter. And then you go to the excuse, well, it's very massive. That's why we haven't seen it. That's the, <laughs> that's the uh, particle physicist excuse for whenever they can't see the particle yet. Oh, it must be more massive, so we can't see it yet. Well, something is elementary as a particle with magnetic charge and no electric charge. If it existed, we would have seen it. And the other thing is, they're assuming that the laws of physics change. The natural laws of physics don't change because they're determined by the quantum field. So you don't get different physics at different times in the universe where you could make particles one time and not make particles at another time. So if magnetic monopoles existed, we would have observed them. And with that, I'll stop and just say I, I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did please like it share and subscribe and if you want to read more about the greatest lies in physics of which i put magnetic monopoles in there that's my my book and then on the flip side a positive construction of quantum field theory is my book the zero point universe and by reading one of my books, that helps support me in my retirement, which I appreciate. And you get to learn more about physics if you do that. So thanks for watching. I'll be talking a lot more about PBS Space Time videos because this guy makes a lot of mistakes. So thanks again.